Uh, okay, uh, уважаемые коллеги. Uh, dear colleagues, once again, uh, good afternoon. We are very glad to see you here, to welcome you here uh, in uh, our discussion, which will be called uh, New Leap to Space and will be devoted to new technologies which are actively being implemented in our industry. And uh, the topic that we would like to touch upon today is really interesting. Space and space industry has always been uh, on the forefront of uh, the science and all innovations which have been implemented here were developed uh, and uh, implemented of leading major cooperation and uh, space was always uh, uh, a priority in many countries and the technologies which has been invented 20 and 30 years ago are used not only in space industry but in other adjacent industries and the space race now that we witnessed uh, 30 or 40 years ago turned to another race it is a race not for the development of space but for commercialization of space and now we see a big number of new dynamic companies who are involved in commercialization of uh, the space. And uh, you may all know such companies as uh, SpaceX from the US, Spybox Imaging, the Russian company Dauria. And we are very glad to, to welcome here the representatives of uh, young, small companies uh, such as Nanoracks and Deep Space Industries. So today we would like to discuss the problem of uh, space innovation and to understand whether the innovations are needed at all here. On one hand, uh, space was always at the forefront, and on the other hand, because uh, it is about the high risk, and these risks are related, first of all, with the people's lives, uh, and on the other hand, financial risks, because capital costs uh, are very high here. And these risks are very high, so the solutions and decisions on implementation should be taken with regard to those risks which are existing. Today we'd like to discuss this issue, and um, please uh, let me introduce to you our participants. So we have the representatives today of uh, uh, space agencies. This is Denis Liskov, uh, Deputy Director of Russian Space Industry, René Pichel, uh, good afternoon, uh, the representative of the European Space Agency in Russia, Igor Burenkov, uh, Deputy General Director of uh, uh, United uh, Space Corporation. Uh, this person represents the public sector of uh, space industry. We also have uh, representatives of private sector, Mikhail Kokoric, founder and director general of uh, Dauria Aerospace, Rick Milson, president of Deep Space Industries, and um, Jeff Manber, the founder and uh, CEO of uh, Nano Rex company. Uh, as an expert today, uh, we have uh, also Anatoly Arcebalski. He represents the Space Agency of Kazakhstan. And uh, we would like to hear from Anatoly how uh, innovations are developed in Kazakhstan. I won't take much time of you, dear colleagues. I'd like to give the floor to Denis Liskov. And I know that Denis has a presentation on, uh, on uh, the topic today. Thank you, Alexei. I will uh, try to be brief. We prepared a small presentation describing the tasks which are set in front of the Federal Space Industry of Russia, uh, Space Agency of Russia, and the, the tasks and, and uh, tasks uh, for Roscosmos to uh, attract innovations in this industry. On the first slide, you can see the description of the federal uh, program, the new federal program in the space industry, uh, which is planned until 2015. Today we have the draft program of the federal program until 2025. It's been now uh, submitted for consideration in the executive bodies of the Russian Federation to be submitted in the, uh, by the end of the year to the government. And the main tasks are described here are not exhaustive. They're not limited to this one slide of presentation. I just try to concentrate uh, and to focus on the most important uh, uh, issues which are uh, included in this federal program. On the next slide, 
we see the excerpts about the technologies which on the opinion of Roscosmos will be needed to uh, realize those tasks which we set in front of us until 2030. This is not an exhaustive list again, and as you may see, taking into account the tasks which we have, uh, it won't be uh, uh, possible to solve them without new solutions and innovative solutions. So we as Roscosmos understand that the innovations tasks and the uh, attraction of innovation is a key task in the space industry to realize those tasks which we set uh, for ourselves. Uh, in more detail, I'd like to tell you about the uh, work of Roscosmos uh, uh, as a federal body responsible for the space policy of Russian Federation, uh, the task of Roscosmos and the government to create the platform and necessary conditions to develop uh, innovations in our country in this area. And in this regard, we have uh, certain base lines, uh, regulatory bases, which are not in, always in line with the reality and needs to be updated, and some other things which are in the process of uh, reconciliation and development of new regulatory bases. This is, of course, some funding sources, different uh, sources, uh, institutional bases. In principle, these are those technical uh, solutions which would allow to generate necessary innovations uh, used in the aerospace industry. We also do not forget about educational uh, institutions because uh, it would not be possible to solve innovation tasks without new talents and uh, new specialists. On the next slide, I uh, tried to um, show you our vision of the structure constructed by the Roscosmos. These are basic infrastructural elements of different kind. This is the shared uh, uh, using center engineering centers, engineer companies. And uh, we see the basis here in uh, the face of the uh, plants of space industry who are both generators and consumers of uh, innovations because they should solve the main task uh, to realize the federal state program in space that we plan to realize. Uh, there are also innovative uh, small and medium enterprises uh, and bright representatives of uh, uh, which are present here at our panel discussion today. We can, uh, in more detail, discuss this topic in the form of uh, our discussion. What is already underway? I must uh, stress that we not uh, stop uh, at one place. Roscosmos is being generating uh, the environment of innovation, and within this job, there are two airspace clusters built, one in Samara region, based on uh, the Progress uh, uh, joint stock company and uh, the cluster of satellite innovations on our basis enterprise, uh, Assess Reshetnyovo. Now we started to create a new territorial cluster based on uh, Proton Enterprise Perm plant. Naturally, we uh, have other plans for development and the second tool, the second vehicle that we actively use is creation of so-called technological platforms where we combine scientific institutions and enterprises based on technological tasks needs to be realized and solved. We have two such technological clusters, one based on our enterprise Tsnimash and Moscow Aviation Institute and the second cluster is this Sputnik, uh, is a satellite platform based on information satellite uh, systems Reshetnyova. As for the third area of support based on our industrial scientific research center uh, we created the shared uh, scientific center for Roscosmos, which contains a big uh, volume of scientific equipment, the center of nanotechnologies, and uh, all space institutions can use and can uh, source uh, f uh, necessary platforms for their tests from this shared center. 
uh, here we include not only Roscosmos uh, companies, every innovative company can apply to this center for support and help. Of course, we shouldn't forget uh, the educational aspect without universities, without uh, uh, academics. Uh, it would not be possible to realize the ambitious uh, aerospace um, program. It would be too optimistic to say that we would uh, gain some success without the inflow of new talents. So within this work, last year we have created uh, an educational consortium in which included 38 institutes, three academies and 16 uh, aerospace plants and other educational institutions. And within these efforts, we carry out interaction on those topics on special and peculiar projects. We prepare experts for these projects and uh, they uh, undergo training uh, in uh, enterprises and uh, stay at these enterprises as uh, new talents and uh, potential uh, experts and, uh, and high-skilled experts. In the recent times, we actively involve scientific centers of universities to uh, working within the federal space program. We do it not directly, but through our industrial uh, scientific institutions. For instance, for 2014-2015, our plan is to involve uh, around 340 million ruble fundings for uh, RD institutions. And for those RD efforts, which are executed uh, for the sake of the federal space program. And uh, later on, we plan to roll it out, uh, where the main focus is made on uh, R&Ds and uh, new breakthrough scientific research. It should be noted here that uh, just recently, Roscosmos placed uh, uh, to, took uh, a targeted position to provide to academic institutions and scientific institutions opportunities to uh, launch uh, small uh, space vehicles with the small uh, payloads uh, within the federal program. When uh, the launch vehicle has uh, success, uh, excessive uh, power sources, we provide additional uh, opportunities for our uh, institutions to uh, launch small vehicles up to 100, 150 kilograms in order to uh, test new technologies and practically to confirm those technical solutions in space which has uh, been planned uh, on the ground. And starting from the new year, we have the new discussion in this area and we plan to involve Skolkova Center to these efforts to uh, make it possible for new startups to have uh, easier access to the space, not on the full-fledged commercial basis, in order to develop and test the developments which in future would be needed by our federal space program, and to give such an opportunity to new companies, to young companies, to conform their solutions which they uh, uh, include in their innovative products. In general, uh, from the point of view of educational consortiums, I already told you that uh, uh, we plan a scope of uh, works in this area and the participation of educational institutions for us would be the main basis to prepare uh, specialists and uh, people. It, a lot of edu equipment can be purchased, but without professionals and high skill uh, talents, uh, it won't be possible to realize uh, the uh, space program. In general, uh, that was all that I wanted to present. I am ready to discuss with you additionally uh, those uh, innovative areas that we as Roscosmos see uh, uh, as a key uh, precondition to solve future tasks. But I think we can do it in the format of discussion, and I'd like to give the floor to our other presenters. Uh, thank you so much, Denise. Now, I would like... Uh, 
the audience to ask uh, one or two questions to every speaker. Do you have any questions to Denise? Uh, Dmitry Saitlin from Spectral Laser Company. Uh, sorry, the question is out of the microphone. I'm representing Spectro Laser Company, um, Skolkovo Research Center, and I'm in charge of uh, uh, combustion systems, and we work with all uh, companies, and we have achieved uh, certain progress. We are trying to become part of the chain. So my question applies to two th things. So first of all, regarding licensing, we are not a, a big company and we don't have administrative system. We are only subject. We uh, received a certification to, together with the NIMASH. Um, so we received a file we had to call collect a file of 250 pages. So we had three attempts for applying for the license. Uh, and uh, so this is just a comment uh, related to Skolkova. Why do we need it? Uh, and so this is the consequence of our second question. We need that not just uh, to experiment, uh, but to be part of our uh, combustion modes and to participate uh, larger research programs together with Roscosmos. So uh, we would like uh, such re research programs where we could uh, be involved uh, from the startup stage to engine uh, rocket stealth. We would like to have uh, all more projects like this, so that would imply for the directive involvement of the company, so that the space agency, the Ross uh, Cosmos, would uh, guide us in how we can observe standards. Well, okay. I guess uh, this was not rather a question, but a comment, a cry of the soul. So regarding licenses, from the very beginning, I said that uh, not the entire legal framework is in line with today's reality. And Roscosmos is continuing uh, work on reviewing uh, ghost uh, standards before Space um, industry used to be a state monopoly with its own uh, regulations and normative acts, which are, of course, uh, prevent uh, young private companies to enter this field. And uh, some barriers are artificial that had to do with the military acceptance and certification. We realize this is not a new problem. We know about that, and gradually we are working to on changing approaches to standards. But you can imagine the scope of work we need to carry out in order uh, to rework the entire legal framework uh, existing at the moment and which uh, the companies use in their work. So, and when you got a denial from Roscosmos, uh, I guess you got some explanations uh, regarding uh, parameters uh, where and requirements your company failed to meet. So we, of course, would like to welcome all young companies and that they are ready uh, to participate in research programs. But I would like to assure you that uh, uh, we don't have any blind alleys. In every situation, there are different approaches on how to tackle them. So if you don't uh, directly meet requirements, um, well, you should know that Roscosmos uh, reviews 
10% of existing standards every year, 10% of standards existing in our industry. And this restriction uh, doesn't only relate to financial aspects, but um, physically, it's really immense work. We need to review databases existing in the European Union, in the United States of America. We need to pick up uh, the most applicable points which could which are suitable for our national context so if you would trust me uh, you can address me directly and i would like to check uh, what where you failed to meet the requirements thank you denise so i think uh, this is the point where skolkovo and ross cosmos can cooperate to facilitate access to younger private companies. Now, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Igor Burenkov, uh, Deputy Director of uh, the United Space uh, Corporation. Igor, I would like to listen, uh, to find a question uh, to the question why United uh, Space Corporation uh, has to uh, integrate and implement innovations. So is it interesting to you and what in tools uh, could be, do you see as efficient uh, from the perspective of the United uh, uh, Space Corporations? So good afternoon. I think I should begin uh, with naming a number of parameters. And we also need to answer the key um, question of our uh, today's session. So, uh, space is uh, has always been the dream of the humanity, and uh, today, um, space uh, is deemed to help people to become more human. So, and uh, this dream now uh, became reality for the Russian space industry. That's why the. United uh, Space Corporation was established. Uh, we need to transform the very methods of uh, uh, developing and manufacturing products. And uh, the upper goal is uh, the global competitiveness of our uh, rocket space industry. And of course, the great leap which took place in Russia and uh, worldwide in 1950s, so that impulse to new technologies, of course, everybody looks forward to the same type of leap nowadays. And of course, uh, innovations continue um, to exist, but the leap is not as huge as it used to be in 1950s. Uh, the question is why, but I don't think well, of course, we can ask that question to our foreign colleagues. Of course, they have similar problems, but at a different level, because they had time in the 90s, in the 1980s, and the 1990s, they could move to a new stage in developing their uh, industry, in creating huge conglomerates, well, private, or like in the States, or public, like in Europe, and uh, they moved to a new stage, uh, creating opportunities for new innovation, uh, providing different chances to adjacent industries. This wasn't the case in Russia, so, and for today, this is one of the tasks uh, we face. And today, we should not only struggle for lower self costs of uh, launching uh, space projectiles, but also to enable Russian uh, space industry to become innovative. And only once we meet this precondition, we can talk about uh, the next step and on how innovations in one, such wonderful innovative centers like Skolkova could be used here in Russia. And uh, I don't mean that nothing is being done here and that we should wait for a number of time. Uh, even today we work with the Skolkova Foundation and we have a number of projects on uh, restructuring and reorganizing industry. This work is underway and uh, 
if uh, you read our publications or watch our TV programs, you may have an impression that uh, the history of Russian space industry is a history of failures. No, uh, there were some wonderful breakthroughs, uh, not so evident uh, like they used to be in older days. So going back to the question uh, asked by Alexei, we couldn't uh, stay in the older paradigm. Um, we uh, that means to continue producing everything at the level which uh, we were satisfied with uh, five years ago. So as Lewis Carroll wrote in his uh, tale uh, about uh, Alice in Wonderland, just to stay where you are, you, you need to uh, be running fast. So this uh, position is uh, quite clear. And if we would uh, consider tasks uh, we have in front of us, we should notice that uh, not uh, all our uh, space uh, companies like other technological companies face uh, big problems. Of course, we have companies where we can uh, apply innovations already now, where uh, latest development could be applied. And as we saw from the previous presentation, by Denis uh, Leskov, and we saw uh, Reshitnov for uh, space company, um, which is part of the United uh, Space Corporation. So it's one of the most uh, successful companies in the world, a development platform for our satellites. Uh, but uh, we should get ready for tomorrow, today. So that's why uh, our company is taking part in Skolko. Uh, programs. Uh, yesterday, the uh, Igor Komarov, uh, the general director of the corporation, uh, signed an agreement with Skolkova and together with uh, uh, Viktor Vexelberg, uh, the president of Skolkova. And for us, it's critically important uh, to create these bases uh, today. Mm, at the time, industrial companies will develop uh, the foundation, we need to understand where we should head for. Um, this would be the task not only for us uh, as the production companies, but also uh, the research uh, institute needs that understanding uh, for us uh, to make the reform of our space uh, industry efficient. And I think that now our corporation also uh, needs to say a couple of words about the corporations. So we were only developed in March 2014 following a decree of uh, Vladimir Putin, the president of the Russian Federation. And our aim is uh, to make our country competitive in the long run in uh, producing space industry um, products. Uh, we also uh, need to achieve goals uh, of the national space program and uh, the state uh, defense industry order. Uh, our corporation is the one that implements, that takes the public order in producing uh, space and aircraft uh, products uh, with, uh, and our priorities are high quality and reliability of our for our products. We need to make mm, uh, all enterprises which are part of the corporations competitive. And when I say competitive, I don't always uh, talk about uh, the global competition. So despite uh, Alexis comment, well, of course, we are a public uh, uh, part of the public sector, but we are an open joystick company and uh, our aim is to make our enterprises efficient and uh, uh, competitive uh, so our aim is not building to build up muscles of our corporations but to make use of our corporate tools to transform enterprises mm. so we are we focus on financial uh, improvement and uh, we have a number of uh, 
experts and professionals uh, already working in our companies. And a clear example of our work in that uh, um, financial improvement would be Hrunichev Center, one of the largest enterprises in our industry. And uh, its uh, problems are well known. And to a large extent, they are related to the fact that Khrunichev, he uh, initially a very successful enterprise, had uh, to include cooperation, well, its economic partners, which were not in a very sound economic condition. And that uh, led to a poorer financial status of uh, the entire corporation. Um, so um, our aim would be to uh, change uh, the situation. So uh, and uh, we developed the program on our own and together with the Ross Cosmos um, and the aim of all people uh, who wants uh, changes in the country and in the space industry is likely um, to bring positive results, uh, not to produce uh, continuous rivalry. Now, a couple of words on what support to private initiatives uh, and partnership, um, public-private partnership uh, may mean. So, if our colleagues from the United States uh, show a major breakthrough in this area, we see that uh, this state, uh, the public budget is still the main customer. Because the, even in the United States, uh, with a high level of the private initiatives, uh, um, this, most of the orders, 70 to 80 percent, come from the state. So what do we have to change? apart from the problems we are trying to implement in our country. We have a global task. So in my vision, the main thing Russia can offer the space industry, uh, of course, uh, in pilot space industry and in rocket engines, our leadership is not to be disputed, and nobody denies it. And practice uh, has shown that uh, our colleagues welcome cooperation in all those area, areas. And our colleagues continue cooperating with us uh, despite all sort of internal factors. So as I see it, uh, mission of Russia would be to uh, get back to the, to the external arena um, to support uh, competition and uh, to make an, our next step to produce innovative, competitive environment that existed in the 1950s, but at uh, a higher level of quality. Uh, back in the days, it was uh, an opposition between the two uh, military blocks. Now, time has come to compete in the area of research and technology. And uh, I'm sure that that sort of competition will uh, produce another uh, shortage of innovation both in our country and abroad. And from our side, uh, we will encourage uh, that status of things and we will try to uh, pursue that goal. And it would be hard to underestimate uh, this goal. We cannot afford to uh, shut down for a certain period of time. Mm. We need to do it uh, together uh, with carrying out uh, huge uh, um, goals we have in front of us uh, in uh, space industry and in defense industry. And I hope you will help us uh, with that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh um, thank you, Igor. Um, we have time only for one short question to Igor, please. Thank you for your interesting presentation. I'd like to understand, uh, does uh, the corporation plan to take uh, the responsibility for economic foresight and uh, the development of technologies, or is it a function 
of, as initially planned, will be left for the directors and uh, chief constructors of uh, the enterprise, chief engineers. Thank you, Alexander, for your question. You know, if you uh, proposed it personally to me, but I work with information, with uh, media, with idea promotion of uh, those tasks which are set for the corporation. If you proposed to me to uh, estimate some uh, lunar, some moon basis project, I would say that uh, the specialists should be involved in that process uh, who devote their lives to this. Because as in uh, all other countries, a big number of people uh, engaged on the professional level in uh, their activities practically do not split these notions, life and career, life and job. So I would give the following answer. Everything which corporation would bring to the organizational process in terms of help and support to develop this area, it uh, 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 will be done for sure. And every enterprise, practically every enterprise, have uh, uh, their own construction and engineering bureaus. And the, the development of these bureaus is uh, the precondition for uh, the future development of Russian space industry. And of course, it will be naturally if the enterprise uh, has difficulties to uh, coordinate their work and to organize their work on economic basis, the corporation should do uh, its best to help them. If we speak about process optimization, about, uh, let's say, the moment of understanding and uh, understanding of uh, and bringing in economic instruments in uh, uh, the space industry. It doesn't mean that we should uh, exaggerate there. Every innovation things, innovative thing cannot be profitable from the beginning and uh, not understanding of this uh, aspect can have catastrophic impact. Uh, here we need to have some balance and which is most important, the specialists, which uh, are the precious pool and technological basis of Russian science should be supported, of course. Corporation will participate in all these processes without replacing the institutes which are acting now, but developing and uh, helping them to migrate to normal existence and profitable existence in the modern conditions, not only of Russian economy, which uh, is uh, still going, moving forward with all difficulties, but also the global economy. It's not uh, the inventing of a wheel, it's just the demand of the reality. Today we can hear many times a political or geopolitical notion, a real policy. It means that economic interests and other interests prevail ideological interests. The reality is good everywhere, and it's also very useful for, to understand the situation where we are now, taking into account the development of the space industry in Russia, and uh, the felt diminishment, diminishing is uh, even uh, worse than uh, uh, the pride here. Our task is to hear to look and to act, and we should do it in parallel. And I can assure you that this is really doable. And uh, it also makes sense, and uh, I'm optimistic about it also because I know people who uh, manage the corporation now, I know their achievement in other areas, and I understand that that's possible. Thank you. But everything is possible. Igor, thank you very much for such an optimistic finishing word. I'd like to move the give the floor to Mr. René Pichel, representing European Space uh, Agency. He heads uh, the representative office of uh, Space uh, Agency here. René, you have 10 minutes, and we'd like to uh, listen to the those mechanisms which are used in Europe to support innovation and uh, the problems that you see in the aer uh, aerospace industry of Europe. Thank you, Mikhail. My name is uh, René Michel. I'm the head of the European uh, Agency, uh, European uh, Space Agency in uh, Russia. I'll try to speak in Russian, uh, although my presentation is in English. 
please uh, excuse me if uh, there will be some uh, English words which is hardly to be translated into Russian. First of all, I'd uh, like to say that innovation is a combination of idea with client. Uh, the idea is the first step, but to make this idea an innovation, we need a client to uh, use this idea. And the name of our session uh, is uh, related only to the smaller part of the process that I wanted to describe a little bit uh, more in detail um, in regard of our uh, European Space Agency. We have to stress that uh, for innovations in space uh, there are some peculiarities. First of all, uh, the long term uh, of our program uh, long-term programs, the market that we uh, focus on, and as uh, already was mentioned uh, from the public and private point of view, and uh, also our projects are very large-scale projects. And here we see some, uh, some uh, in effect of these peculiarities. Uh, I'd like to stop a little bit more in detail on uh, the mechanisms of uh, how we develop technologies and ideas in our agency. And in the second part of my presentation, I'd like to speak more about uh, how we bring these ideas closer to our potential customers. I'd like to mention that innovation uh, is in our DNIs, and uh, it is uh, also included in our charters that we need to deal with them um, and uh, we have some responsibilities together with our industry to uh, go this way and as it is written here you may also see 8% of our budget uh, should be invested directly in uh, research and development of uh, our technologies it is all done not separately from uh, the industry, but together with the industry. It is necessary to take into account the fact that we don't have such an organization as DARPA in the US, which gets money from uh, the state and from private companies to uh, be involved in high-risk operations. We don't have this thing. We work closer to the uh, requirements which uh, are presented by our industry. We should also understand that this thing, this is uh, the driver for our industry, uh, which uh, makes it is ma makes it compatible, uh, and uh, mm, we need to move this way. If we speak directly about the mechanisms, we should state that this all is dependent on the technical availability level that we look at. If we speak about the very primary initial stages, here we have a mechanism which is called advanced concept team. And on the next slide, I will explain to you what does it mean. If we have more developed technologies, so we have a program called general studies program which implies funding of these developing technologies. We also have a requirement that all new missions should contain uh, the improvement of uh, the technological availability level. At least there should be three technological level to uh, be passed uh, within one year in our missions. If it's not in place, this mission is rejected for further development. We have uh, satellites, programs, uh, proba satellites uh, to test new technologies to be further used in space and such satellite 
which represents our development program on the new technological level. As already, as I mentioned about first steps, this is our advanced concepts team. This is a team of young people who develop new ideas uh, um, and it is done in a close cooperation with universities, with uh, small and medium enterprises. Uh, they uh, get money and uh, they are free to use uh, this money to develop new ideas. If uh, we speak about uh, next step, the program which is called General Studies Program, again, this is an integral part of our budget and uh, research and development of technologies is made in three different directions which you may see here again it states that this activity is always linked to peculiar and specific task it is not not only a free floating this is a concrete task Again, I should say that this all happens uh, along in alignment with the priorities and targets set uh, up front. I'd like to stress only those priorities uh, uh, and technologies uh, which were of the most interest for us uh, for the future decade. This is, first of all, the docking. Uh, the docking with a non-corporated uh, incorporated object landing and the technology of uh, uh, smart landing, everything which is related to robotics, everything related to the life support systems for long-term flights, and so on. Uh, everything is listed here on this slide. You may see it here. I'd like to move on to the second part of my presentation related to the way how we bring our new ideas and new technologies closer to our potential clients. And I'd like to stress, uh, I have uh, my colleagues here for Salzgeber uh, who can answer all questions related to this second part because he is uh, responsible for the office. Uh, which is dealing with these issues. Here we s you, you see enlisted all uh, tools that we use to um, can make connection with new clients and to contact them, to support them in uh, uh, accepting our new technologies and ideas. First of all, uh, these are inventions uh, expressed in patents. Secondly, these are so-called brokers people who are close to the consumers and who understand their needs and who can connect what is needed and with uh, what we have and to make this bridge. Uh, thirdly, these are so-called ambassadors who in general uh, are involved in uh, the activities of linking what we have and what is needed. And uh, more specific, uh, we have uh, here so-called uh, business incubation centers. Uh, here we help small companies to grow, and uh, if they take some idea or technology and uh, are willing to implement it in their business, of course they need help. And uh, these centers uh, are created with this end. And the last instrument here is uh, participation in uh, funding new uh, small companies of that kind to make them uh, able to use this idea and to, to, to take benefit of the new technologies. Once again, in our portfolio now, we have uh, 450 patents. Uh, here we show the areas uh, they cover. And uh, we can see that they cover practically the whole uh, bunch uh, which is of interest for us. And again, we develop the network of ambassadors and brokers to 
be closer to our future consumers. As an example, you asked for examples. This is a huge field, a feature which is used in cars to uh, capture heat. Uh, previously, it was made of aluminium. Now it is made of steel. Uh, and for us, the technology of uh, molding a, a very thin steel is a new technology, is more temperature resistant, and is, has a longer life cycle than previous solutions. It is already used by BMW. Uh, company in new in their new cars uh, the second example use of leader technology uh, this is the wind uh, mills uh, generators generating power and uh, using uh, these equipment we can uh, detect uh, the wind blows uh, two seconds in advance and uh, we can change the speed of rotation this also helps to uh, extend the life cycle of these windmills. This is a uh, new technology which is already used. Uh, and uh, this is a company. There is a company which uh, impl imp 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 uses this technology in uh, their commercial uh, activity. This map shows where are our uh, broker centers, uh, where are our uh, ambassador centers and business incubators. It shows that uh, we are there where the client is, not only in Paris, where's our headquarters, but also closer to those people who uh, are closer to the business. And besides that, of course, we subsidize conferences uh, which support search for these new solutions and uh, their application in the real life. For instance, everything which is uh, related to the navigation systems. Here I'd like to finish. Thank you. Thank you, Rene. Dear colleagues, do you have any questions to our guests, please? Thank you very much for your interesting presentation in Russian. Uh, Vladimir, uh, U South uh, Ural uh, Technical University. Uh, when you make the research, do you compete uh, between different research centers? Because it's obviously that you work uh, on one market or you cooperate or you're it is decided for each project separately because uh, anyway it is all done together with the industry of course we uh, shouldn't uh, and you're absolutely right we should not uh, take their place in the technology development but on the other hand sometimes uh, there is a technology which could be too expensive for them to develop uh, in the initial stage and we have some agreements of course we try to uh, to have agreement with them and because we get our money from uh, our member states of course uh, they are not interested in uh, paying uh, uh, the money twice to paying to the industry and to the agency um, and before the initial stage it is excluded more or less so you agree on the, yes you have an agreement Thank you, dear colleagues. I'd like to give the floor to Mikhail Kokoric. Mikhail, you are the uh, regular participant of our forum. And uh, we heard that uh, within the last year, Dauria company achieved uh, a, a very big success. And Skolko Foundation was uh, 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 a participant of this success. And we'd like to hear from you where uh, the company Dauria is now. Uh, who are your clients and what are your plans for the future? Please. Uh, good afternoon. I think I would start my presentation with telling you a bit about what is private space and how space can be private. Because for many years, not only in Russia and in the Soviet Union, but also in the West, the main um, space used to be a, a main activity area for um, for the state, 
Of course, it was related to the private business, but in the main uh, trends of mastering space, um, the state and public uh, organizations, they always played uh, the major role. And now we see a certain burst of uh, private companies, uh, companies that got both uh, public and private finance. So why um, is uh, today the time for the private uh, uh, companies uh, in the space industries? There were a number of reasons um, th which led to the fact that the number of uh, space uh, objects uh, launched uh, by uh, private companies uh, mm, becomes two or three times, increases twice or thrice uh, every year. And I think uh, uh, Jeff Manber would also comment on that. Mm. Of course, today, uh, building a space uh, uh, machine is uh, much more, much cheaper compared to uh, the way it used to be uh, a number of years ago. Well, uh, because many microelectronic components uh, are the same as used as in land machines. So this is a Drake's machine, which only costs a few uh, hundred thousand dollars. Uh, if you compare it to major space machines, um, it's a major reduction in price, and of course, it has all uh, the characteristics, uh, uh, a, a big uh, satellite has. Um, well, also, it's easy to launch it, uh, and you can launch it uh, together with a, a, an another um, machine. Um, also, cube sets uh, produced by Stanford uh, professors uh, several years ago. So now we have a number of commercial companies which use a standard for creating uh, space groupings. And we also launched uh, uh, two objects uh, with the same standards. Uh, and it's also possible to use uh, the same series, uh, like Lego uh, game. Uh, and of course, uh, there is uh, the market for it. Ten years ago, it would be hard to imagine that everybody would have a s uh, smart uh, phone with uh, um, satellite maps uh, that a smartphone uh, would have the capacity a desktop computer had 10 years ago. And uh, uh, the applications are very different of, uh, from agriculture and uh, various production industries. So the GEAR services or market uh, only accounts for uh, 2 billion US dollars. This is not uh, uh, a, a big amount, but uh, it increased twice uh, in the last two years because GIS, uh, so it's uh, like re remote sensing is, uh, it's like a nested dolls. Uh, it's used in geoinformation systems, uh, which are used in business intelligence. So today's startups, like as Uber, uh, allows to order a taxi. So um, the revenues of such companies are uh, billions of dollars, and uh, uh, they fully transform our um, idea of how satellite systems uh, um, can be used in the consumer's market. So, and we as Deuria, we of course. Uh, 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 oriented towards end uh, customer. We produce a number of uh, ad. Uh, our approaches uh, are based on cloud, and uh, one of our services uh, allow a farmer to go around his field and to track the conditions of uh, um, his plantings to and understand uh, which uh, 
cultures grow better. For an insurer, it's easier uh, to assess um, how uh, plants continue to grow after a hail. And uh, this is the example of how um, so geodata, uh, the satellite images uh, serve as a link between virtual and real world. And they allow us to gather this data in almost real time. So we control our devices. And the f first uh, image shown that the flight control center uh, now nowadays only consists of two computers. And in the nearest future, um, it would be possible to control uh, uh, spaceship uh, from an iPad uh, with just uh, simple finger movements. Uh, we are building space uh, machines and you see that we no longer need huge industries. Uh, 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 and we are fully integrated in the world uh, labor diffusion chain. Our um, first two satellite vehicles launched this year uh, were quite small. So you see that in remote sounding, uh, our niche is uh, for the space vehicles with a cost of below one million uh, US dollars. And this year we uh, want a very interesting uh, tender. Uh, for creating an atom uh, platform uh, with Indian uh, partners. Uh, so we signed a deal for next year's Farnborough's uh, show. So this is a platform on how to reduce the weight of the uh, satellite vehicle uh, several times and how to develop a space vehicle with a cost of just uh, several hundred thousand dollars. So please, um, uh, see, uh, get acquainted with our link on Facebook. Your questions, please. Uh, Rare Earth uh, magazine, a spontaneous question. Mm, so we use our imagination, and some time ago uh, there was Jade, uh, Jade here. Um, uh, satellite which was launched to the moon and the fir first thing they found in the moon was jade and but my question is how do you see the cooperation because I can expect there would be a great deal of competition between the companies uh, how do you see your cooperation with others in future and how you see your place among other companies in some 10 or 20 years uh, as for today uh, the world of private space companies is a tiny world, and we only see uh, very few companies in this market. And we are probably uh, compete uh, for the customer because you see that uh, the tallest uh, uh, Matryoshka doll is uh, the biggest uh, uh, share of the market. And um, you see that there are young uh, companies which produce their own uh, spaceship groupings. So they vary very much in terms of uh, services. If you see with Skybox, with Planet Labs, you know, we focus on different vertical markets. We produce different uh, satellite groupings with different resolutions because everyone purchases his own idea. Uh, because I, I don't see us competing in the nearest future. Uh, this is the same with the uh, public space agency, because uh, we focus on the private space market. And uh, we are, of course, uh, supported uh, by uh, Roscosmos and with Skolkova, but the portfolio of uh, in the portfolio of our orders, uh, public orders uh, are less than 10%. And we are focused on business uh, use and uh, producing our groupings. We are not based on public requirements, but on our idea of what will be demanded in the market. 
Okay, thank you so much, our colleagues. Now I would like to give the floor to Jeff uh, Monber. And I know that your presentation style is very uh, concise. So could you please uh, tell us in brief about the main ideas of your business, of the key stages of NanoRock's company development? Thank you. Giving uh, me the chance to be here today. and. What I'd like to do is continue the presentation of uh, Mikhail and follow through on what he was saying. Um, I'm with Nanorax, and uh, we believe also in private space. Uh, we approached NASA five years ago and said, we don't want your money, and that got their attention. We said, we want to build our own hardware on the space station. We will finance it, and in return, you let us market to customers around the world. And NASA thought about that and said yes. And so today, in five years, we own microscopes, we own centrifuges, we own our own CubeSat deployers. Uh, we have today over 70 small satellites under contract. Um, we have an external platform that we're paying Airbus. We're paying Airbus, uh, which I find pretty funny. Uh, uh, to develop an external platform so you can test sensors outside the space station. We have an agreement with NASA that gives us launch opportunities and gives us real estate on the space station. And for me, what we're seeing is that the answer to space today, space utilization, space exploration, is not government or commercial. It's a partnership. And Nanorax, my company, is only possible because of all the public money that's been spent on the International Space Station. But now we can leverage, we can increase that investment and add our hardware and do so in an efficient manner. And I also want to point out that we're able to invest our money because Space Station is stable in terms of policy. You have American support. European support. Now it seems that we have continued Russian support. And we can't invest our money if it's not stable. We're not fools. Well, we may be fools, but we're not that foolish. And so we will go into Space Station, my investors, because it is a stable international program. And in Washington, there's a lot of debate. Is it commercial? Is it public? And I think the answer is it has to be both. But we're changing the way, we're changing that relationship, I like to think, at Nanorax, in that we provide some of the funding, we provide some of the innovation. We think the perfect spot is a small company in our society. In our society, a lot of the ideas come from smaller companies, and I'm excited that we're seeing that in space as well. So how are we doing? Uh, we have uh, now many companies you know, Planet Labs and, and Stanford, uh, soon will be signing and will be adding to the list the European Space Agency. I'm, I'm pleased to say is now a customer, Spasiva, and, uh, and uh, Earthcast you may have heard about. Very important Canadian company, which is working with Roscosmos, and, and they have sensors on the Russian side, and they're now working with us to have sensors on the American side. So really we're seeing that the International Space Station is really becoming international. And it's a very nice story. I think it's, it's a story that's overlooked because it's kind of a good news story. Our vision from 2010 to 2015 was to really provide a platform where our customers could innovate in technology. And we're doing some very interesting things, and our customers are doing some interesting things in laser communications, biopharmaceuticals, we're beginning to do some robotics, 3D printing in space. Th these technologies are changing the way we think about the space station. Right now, when I want to send a payload up through NASA, Every aspect of that payload is tested by NASA. But with 3D printing, it's manufactured on the station. And NASA doesn't really know what to do with this. 
because now you're going to have materials on the station and products that are not approved, in theory, by the NASA safety team. So this is very interesting, and yet there's a lot of good reasons to have 3D printing in space, because the most expensive part of our business is launch, and the time that it takes to get something onto the station. So if you can manufacture something by doing some software instructions on the ground, it's a complete revolution for how we look at space operations. So we feel we really begun to accomplish our initial vision was to show that the private sector can work with the public space agencies. Now we're looking beyond and we're in very good discussions with our government, the American government, on how does the International Space Station, what, what does it become? Or as I like to say to my friends in the American government, what does the space station become when it grows up? We've spent a lot of money on it, it's a government facility. Private sector is beginning to use it. How does it transition to a commercial sector? What does that mean from an American perspective? From a European perspective, it will mean something different. From a Russian perspective, Japanese perspective, it will mean something different. But we're beginning to ask, what contributions do we make in the private sector? How do we move the space station from government to hybrid, to privatization in a low risk and safe way. You know, and, uh, uh, Alexei asked me today to, to focus on some of the technologies. There are two types of technologies that we're focused on. The first is things that have commercial viability, that, are, that I have paying customers. And the second type of technology is what I need at Nanorax to help move this transition along. So we're learning a lot at Nanorax. We're learning about the marketplace. We're learning about who pays for services. When we started Nanorax, we weren't even sure there would be customers. We put our money down not knowing if there would be any customers. Right now, NASA is 8% of my revenue, but as a customer, just as East is a customer. And I hope, you know, no reason why not one day Roscosmos and others, uh, DLR, German Space Agency is a customer. And to ad address what the gentleman said earlier, for us, if government as customer is commercial, just as when a government employee buys an airplane ticket and flies from Moscow to Paris, that's commercial. So we don't look and say, hmm, this customer is government, nah, that's a little different, and this customer is a biopharmaceutical. No, we have our money at risk, Nanorax is providing a service just like an airplane, and uh, just like in the airplane business, the airports may be publicly funded, you have government workers monitoring the safety, and you buy the ticket from at least most airlines with a private company. So that hybrid, that mix is what we see developing on the International Space Station. And so for us, it's looking at advanced propulsion, extremely important. We're beginning to work with NASA on new propulsions that will be safe to be used on the space station to allow uh, uh, satellites to go up or maybe for us to push off on our platform away from the station. We need new communications. The communications on the station is very poor. Robotics is critical. Nanotechnology, space is expensive. The small, if you can have small things, that's really good. And again, 3D printing. I think 3D printing will fundamentally change how we do low Earth orbit and beyond. There is no reason not to think that in 10 or 15 years, you'll be able to deploy simple uh, hardware, simple satellites that are stored on a commercial platform. You get an order, you send them out using robotics and 3D printing. So this is a very exciting time because I don't expect, and I think uh, some of the other smaller companies, we don't expect, as uh, Mikhail said, we don't expect to just go to NASA or Roscosmos and say, we want money. We also will give back and say, we'll find services, we'll get customers will help you innovate. So this is, to me, an extremely challenging time, an extremely exciting time, as we begin to think of having space as another place where we do business. So for us, the next chapter 
is we are seeking international partners. Uh, I have a, a, a extreme respect for the capacity and capabilities of the Russian program. In a previous lifetime, I, I sought to keep the Mir space station in orbit, and uh, now I'm committed to keeping the International Space Station in orbit and moving beyond that. We're looking for international partners to help lower the cost, come up with new technology, uh, and really, really move space exploration into a commercial era with the government as a partner. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Any, any questions to Jeff? Well, <laughs> as far as there's no questions, I, oh. I, I'll try to ask my question again. <laughs> uh, so this is a Rare Earth magazine, and, and uh, a question about 3D printer. So uh, you think it will be possible to do it by your logical Printing. Oh, uh. yeah, because this is what I, I felt from you. So it's 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 actually beyond imagination what you are talking about, right? Well, I'll, I'll say that just walking through the exposition here, it's just extraordinary. I mean, what's going on? And so I think my answer is that I don't know the answer. I, I'll provide the platform with others to do it, uh, the research and applications and microgravity and zero gravity. And I'll leave to the students that we're seeing here to come up with things that I can't even think about. So I think all things are possible. I'm an optimist, okay, you know. So I think all things are possible. I think that what we'll see in low Earth orbit in 10, 15 years, very few of us, including myself, really understand what's going to happen in 15 years when you unleash the private sector uh, and the imagination of the private sector into space. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Now I'd like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Rick Tomlinson from uh, Deep Space Industries. Uh, uh, indeed, this is a very interesting company. I recently learned about this company. I looked a short video about Deep Space Industries and uh, my imagination was exploded, basically. I just... Uh, it's just extraordinary. Rick, you, please, you have 10 minutes to explain to the, the participants how it works and how you are going to make money of it. Please, Rick, you have the floor. is a lot of the revolution that you're seeing in commercial space right now began here in Russia with some projects that we were doing together. Yeah. Oh. One, two, one, two, there we are. So the projects that uh, we've started actually some of it started here in Russia when we worked on the Mir project. And we had a, a great time and our partners were amazing people. And we greatly respect the Russian space program. To start with, this is where a lot of our vision comes from. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my company. I'm going to talk a little bit about the vision. I'm going to talk about where we're going and why we're going. But I began, as many of us, with Dr. O'Neill. Uh, we did a commercial actually on the space station many years ago with Radio Shack, the first commercial ever. And again, we worked with our Russian partners to produce that. As I mentioned, we did the Mir project. And I was lucky enough to be able to sign up a gentleman working with Jeff named Dennis Tito, who we also flew in space. I have a company uh, in the United States called Orbital Outfitters. We are breaking ground in two weeks on our new $7 million facility in Texas. We are providing spacesuits for X-Core Aerospace. So if I could show the video, if you don't mind. Коллеги, можно видео включить?
Simple. Our tiny planet sits in a vast sea of resources, including millions of asteroids bathed in the sun's free energy 24 hours a day. The same rocks that could fall from our skies also contain everything we could ever need, both out there and down here. It's time someone sees the opportunity. Deep Space Industries. Deep Space is a new kind of company with a new kind of plan. We don't build rockets. We don't do astronomy. We are explorers and harvesters, makers and suppliers. As they say, timing is everything. And for space, right now is the time. In fact, some of the planet's most successful people are placing their bets on this new frontier. Meanwhile, NASA and others are planning new missions to the moon and Mars. With new space facilities in free space, joining the billions of dollars worth of communication satellites already in orbit. And as they reach beyond Earth's orbit, deep space industries will be there with the fuel, air, and materials they will need to succeed and grow. DSI has assembled an international team of well-known experts and young innovators who are building on our space legacy and creating new technologies and approaches to open the frontier. We will develop and prove ourselves in three areas. Exploring and prospecting for asteroids, harvesting and returning asteroid materials, and processing those materials for use in space and on Earth. Our early systems will be small and largely off-the-shelf components re-engineered for deep space. We will hitch rides on much larger missions with multiple ways to get into space, where our job really begins. With mission costs so low, we'll be able to attract commercial sponsors and build fleets of vehicles to assure our success. Early markets will be satellites in need of fuel, government outposts and commercial facilities, and missions between the Earth and the Moon. As we gain expertise and develop our systems, we will grow them as the frontier grows, so that when the time comes, DSI will be ready. We will be the gas station, the oasis for air and water, and the building supply center for the frontier. This is a long game, perhaps the longest ever. While we earn our way, the long goal is to create a better future for all of us through space resources. When the first asteroid is mined, deep space will be there. When the first space power plants come online, deep space will be there. When the first space colonies are built, deep space will be there. We can have it all. We can have an amazing future. The resources of space will lead to a new renaissance, both in space and back here on our precious Mother Earth. We are deep space. The frontier is coming, and our time is now. Now, having a fancy video is one thing, but actually being able to deliver is something else. We actually have in our company the, the gentleman who started the entire concept of mining asteroids, Dr. John Lewis. Um, and by the way, it is important that we're in space. Um, every once in a while, Zeus or God, or whoever you believe in, sends us a little reminder. And uh, being out there in space means that our company and the other companies like us are probably at some point going to be the ones doing the work to help save the planet. This is exactly why it's very interesting to be out there. If you were to walk outside right now and pick up a handful of dirt, just dirt, and you carried that dirt into space, that's how much it would be worth. 205,000 rubles. That bucket load is worth 3 trillion rubles. <laughs> that's a lot of money. And that's only up there. Now. What we're trying to do is get ahead of the game. Our business plan is not three years long or five years long. Our business plan is 15 years, 20 years. That's a long time. Except when you talk to terrestrial mining companies and other companies that do large projects, 
that is not so long for them. We have a lot of good people working very hard on this. They are the local resources in space. We want to be the gas station. We want to provide the air, the water, the things you need to live on, the building materials, as our friends in the other companies get into space. But to do that, we have to begin now. This I'm revealing right here is one of the first times anybody's seen this. This is something our company is working on right now. The Dynamic Object Transport System, DOTS. This will be launched next year. It is what's called a 3U CubeSat. It's only about, mm, about this long. This is the innovation that was being spoken of earlier. It will be one of the most advanced CubeSats ever flown. And as our company always does, one of our rules to reduce risk is rather than spending a lot of money on the last 5%, we build three of everything. And we launch them at different times so we can see what fails and what succeeds. This will begin something uh, revolutionary and something we're very excited about. Later on, we hope to get into what we call the mothership. That is the idea where we begin to cooperate with others and carry other payloads to the frontier, to asteroids and destinations in deep space. Again, these are three U, very small. We hope to work with other countries and other partners to do this sort of activity. Our first customer, by the way, was commercial. It wasn't the government. And the DOT spacecraft I just showed you, we are planning on having sponsored commercially. Now, there's a lot more I could tell you, but I'm not going to tell you. If you're an interested investor, we can talk about that later. Now, very quickly, I want to get into a couple of ideas and move into some of the, the bigger concepts. And this, I'm taking my hat off, because this is a different thing, not my company. This is my passion. For the movement, a lot of what I do is to be the evangelist, to speak about why we do these things. And it's very important, when you see what is happening in the United States with these companies, that you understand why it's happening. It is not so much about satellites. It is about doing something important. You see, without a why, you can't do the big things. We went to the moon, my country did, the other countries, Russia. We went to the moon for reasons that were not sustainable in the long run. The reason there are people who believe we never went to the moon is because we're not there now, and it makes no sense. If we don't have the right reasons, if we move to Mars and head towards Mars, we will not be there in 20 years or 30 years. We might even get there and then give up. It's all about why. In my country, we had the shuttle end recently, and many people threw up their hands and said, oh my god, it's over. But it's not over. It's not at all over at all. It's the beginning of a new era. We're seeing, as here in Russia, the space program continues full speed. And new innovations are being introduced, as you've heard today, by different companies and different people. x in the United States is flying. We provide the spacesuits. They're going to be flying next year. They're giving Richard Branson a rent for their money. SpaceX and the Dragon capsule, they're flying. Elon Musk is going to Mars in the 2020s. And if you don't understand why he's building a company, it's because he wants to go to Mars. He's not building the company so he can make a lot of money. In fact, we used to have a joke in our field that if you want to make a million dollars in space, you have to start with a billion. They do it because they have a dream. And there are other people that have dreams in the world. It's going to happen. It's coming. So as I like to say, let a thousand rockets fly. Let us all get up there. And by the way, I want to point out something. And this may fly in the face of some... I may not get invited back after this one. I'm sorry. But governments do not innovate. Now, in, in the case of war or when the uh, economic well-being of their political elites are threatened in every country, well, they can get a little bit innovative. But most often, they procrastinate, they imitate, they regulate. But smart governments, they lay out a vision that calls forth for innovation. They embrace new frontiers. They create a climate of innovation. They do not compete with their own people. And they catalyze innovation. That's how they move forward. The public-private partnership that Jeff spoke of. And they reward and celebrate. 
Space is a frontier, and there are some basic principles we need to understand as we open space. Again, I'm interested in people. It's not people or robots to me. It's robots first, followed by people. Robots can't breed. I want to go breed. I want to spread into space. Space is a place. It's not a program. Frontiers are opened by governments, not by governments for the people, but by people with the support of, or in spite of, their governments. And nobody stays until somebody pays. Somebody has to pay the bills. And you have to have the right to own. This is going to be controversial. This is coming. This is going to be a very big issue. Can you own the place you go in space or not? There are certain requirements to open the frontier. You have to have regular and reliable access. You have to be able to get there and get back and do that over and over again safely and repeatedly. You have to be able to use the resources of space to live on and to profit from. And a government that supports the idea of opening the space or at least stays out of the way. And you have to have a culture that understands what you're doing. Not everybody has to go. Remember, when they began to explore what they call the new world, most people in the old world had never been more than three or four kilometers from their home at the maximum. Most people, even the, the princes and the kings, very rarely traveled. So why space? Well, there are all these different reasons, and it's interesting, and this will get to the very core of the matter, and I'll wrap it up here in a moment. The further out you go, the less the basic reasons we all make up are involved. Now, if you go to Leo, just a few hundred miles up, you have all of these reasons. If you go to the moon, you have a few less reasons. Resources and tourism, maybe. You know, somebody wants to have a condominium, uh, an apartment on the moon, and be able to look at the Earth out their window. When you go to Mars, you have fewer reasons. In fact, there is no real economic reason to go to Mars. You don't make money by going to Mars. And this is where we begin to peel open the real reason that the people that you see in the United States, and I think in other countries, who are going to be starting very quickly and coming up very fast, are going into space. You see, there's no economic reason to go to Mars. There isn't. You're not going to be exporting water or exporting technologies that somebody closer to the Earth isn't going to already be doing. We're just making this stuff up. We go because we want to go to space. We go because it's there. We go because we want to. We go because it's inspiring. We go because we feel called to go. We go because that is what we, as living creatures, do. It's because that's why we are here. My belief is that we're here to go there. This time, we're not going to take it from anybody. That's a very different thing than what we've done here on the Earth. This time, we get to give it to everybody. I want to carry the seeds of life to places that aren't alive. I want to carry the light of life to worlds that are now dark. I want to create the moment of the greatest innovation of all time. That is why I'm in this field. Many of you, I don't care what space agency, what space company you work for. Rick, Rick, I'm, I'm really sorry. You want sorry. to talk Rick. about your return on investment and other things. At the uh, end Rick. of the day, that's Rick. why you want to go. I'm, I'm really sorry. I, we're I'm kind done. of running out of time here. So, are, are you finished? Are you done? Okay. Done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. Look, I, I, I can't, I can't help my, I, I can't. Yeah. Thank you. I can't stand asking the question. The asteroid that fell down at Chelyabinsk, like a year and a half ago, was it uh, DSI delivery, or was it your competitors who just delivered this asteroid down <laughs> on Earth? So, w what was the case? I wish I could say it was a publicity stunt, but. Very ironic about that is that we had just started Deep Space Industries uh, two months before. And we were hoping to be very, very quiet and get our work done and do our business plans, maybe make a contract, things like that. And then Chelyabinsk happened. And everybody in America that ever had a space company or ever had an idea for doing an asteroid project came 
out of the woodwork and came for money to NASA and it was everywhere. So no, unfortunately, uh, no, we weren't able to arrange that. But it's, it's really interesting to see that um, it has helped to wake people up so that they can understand. We look at asteroids as both a threat and a promise. It is like eat or be eaten. Okay, right. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for, 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 for talking uh, at that panel. I think the panel was really, in, uh, really interesting, special. Like the, the last part with, uh, with, with Rick, it was really, you know, uh, it, it lifted my spirit, uh, really. So let us thank our speakers again. So, and thank you for all of the audience.